everybody. Welcome to the Sherman Show. I'm Jeff Sherman here with my co-host Sam Lau. Hey, hey. And today is April 5th, 2022. And we have none other than Robert Cohen, a portfolio manager here at DoubleLine and also the head of our global developed credit team. Welcome back to the show, Robert. Thank you. Glad to be here. So let's get to let's get down to brass tacks. It's been a rough start to the uh, year across fixed income. Uh, stocks are down, uh, bonds are down, loans are kind of uh-ish. Uh, we'll talk about that, I'm sure. Um, there was really no shelter from negative returns in investment grade or below investment grade corporate bonds. So what's going on? Why the carnage? What are your thoughts about those markets today? Yeah, well, uh, you know, we sort of turned the corner from 2021, where we had a very accommodative uh, macro condition with monetary and fiscal stimulus, Inflation sort of started earlier in the year to be somewhat moderate and then built over time. The Fed was accommodative. And then we turned the corner into 2022 with the concern about rising rates. And asset classes that had long duration suffered damage in, in 2022. Uh, I feel like that was you know, maybe the beginning of the year. And we're in a point now where they're sort of a handing off the baton from worrying about rates and how how hawkish the fed's going to be to now starting to be a worry of where are we going with growth so i think the carnage that's mostly been felt in the market as as you can see in different asset classes has been from rates uh and as you mentioned you know bank loans with have you know a zero nearly zero duration have had the least carnage so investment grade has the longest duration had the most damage and then lower duration assets uh, floating rates, CLOs, things like that have had the least damage. As we turn the corner now, I think we have to think about, well, I don't know if the rate move is complete, but it's well along the way. I think we have to think now about what does that do for growth? And uh, that's kind of uh, where I feel we are right now. Yeah. So, so let's talk about that a little bit deeper. So you're talking about the rate movement upward. So it's a repricing or a reflationary uh, trade on both inflation as well as the growth story, um, a less accommodative Fed, a less accommodative central banks around the world. But you mentioned growth in this equation. So how do you kind of rationalize or, or uh, yeah, just rationalize this higher rate move and then causing gross concern? So why is there a concern with growth? Is it the rate move or is there something underpinning the economy? Well, I think it's a concern that uh, inflation and rates, well, let's take inflation first, inflation uh, infiltrates uh, a lot of the economy and for the consumer prices start to rise. The most easy, the easiest thing to visualize is gasoline. We all see gasoline going up and that's more expensive for the consumer. Groceries, other, other uh, consumer staples are just more expensive and the consumer does not have a infinite uh, capacity to absorb those price increases, particularly in an environment where their uh, wage growth is negative on a real basis, meaning their wage growth is not keeping pace with inflation. So if the average consumer is spending uh, money on things they have to buy and that price keeps rising, the things they don't have to buy become something that maybe they choose to consume less of or stop consuming altogether. Uh, interest rates are another component of, of this. As rates go up, uh, the consumer's propensity to buy things they don't need goes down, uh, whether it's housing, autos, other, other uh, consumer, um, uh, consumer goods that uh, are, are purchased with financing, that, that becomes a headwind. Companies that access the debt markets, their cost of capital is going up. So uh, maybe that slows capital expansion projects. Maybe that slows their uh, or, or reduces their demand to acquire other businesses and so on. That's all a component of growth. And so these are now headwinds where they used to be tailwinds. And so those are things that go into a concern about whether growth can continue at the pace we saw last year. And don't forget, we also, on top of inflation, have just shortages. So even if you're willing to pay the higher price, in many cases, the goods aren't available or the people to hire aren't available. So you throw all that together, I think it creates uh, a concern for growth. 
Yeah, you, you mentioned that. Uh, I just got an a email today on a sofa that I had purchased back in December that was supposed to be delivered in early April, which we're here recording, and just got the random, we're sorry for this, but it'll be July now. Yeah. Uh, no other no other rationale. Didn't even blame the supply chain. Didn't even get to it. It's just that it's expected that anything you, you need that's a kind of bigger ticket item just takes time. Yeah. So, you know, as you look across the, you know, the corporate credit landscape and you start to think about positioning, for instance, and I, you, you mentioned the, the sensitivity to interest rates, the duration of the three sectors, uh, investment grade being the longest duration, then high yield or below investor grade bonds being the, low, the shorter duration, and then really the floating rate component on the loan side. So how do you think about allocating capital across these areas, given uh, what we've seen in the not just in the rate move but also as you're talking about these pressures from wage costs um, input prices into these corporations so how are you thinking about different sectors of the bond market but then also the industries within those sectors of the bond market so feel free to take over for a few minutes on all of that yeah well i think i'm going to focus on an element that you're describing which is credit risk to put the rate concern aside and talk about credit risk I think looking forward, 2022 and beyond, uh, what we're going to see is dispersion. So there's going to be winners and losers. Uh, similar maybe to 2020, hopefully not as severe, but in 2020, there were companies that suffered because the economy was shut down. So you didn't want to be a retailer or a restaurant or a gaming company, but software companies did, you know, did fine. They grew in, in 2020. I think now you have to think about, again, what's gonna work and what isn't gonna work. So um, uh, you have to think about our, uh, more than anything, pricing power and margins. So a company that has pricing power, uh, the ability to pass these inflationary pressures through, that's a company that you probably are more, uh, a little more safe with. A company that maybe consumes a lot of raw materials, let's say packaging, for example, someone who makes uh, containers, plastic bottles, things like of that nature, uh, they don't have the capacity to pass through costs. So as raw materials uh, uh, increase, there's a limit to their ability to pass that on to, the, on to their ultimate customers. They're going to have margin pressures. And that's going to create um, uh, pressures on their cash flows and their ability to service debt. So you really have to think about how do they uh, perform in an environment like this? Now, there are winners, right? Energy. So energy and commodities are a winner. So uh, and it may be in an environment where you worry about more def deflationary uh, conditions, you're worried about energy and commodities and other materials, but in this environment, commodities is a great place to be. So you have to think about uh, what will companies do in, in, in an environment you know, that we're in now with inflationary pressures and rising rates. Uh, and so you know, th that's what it's going to be. It's going to be about bottoms up. First, I think we think about the sector and then about the individual credits. We found even within sectors, there's winners and losers. So I mentioned packaging. So within that general sort of packaging and chemicals is sort of lumped together as a sector, there are some companies that have incredible pricing power. Maybe they sell plastic and other chemical materials into the healthcare industry. Well, they're just gonna pay. Like a pharmaceutical company that has a very high margin for a drug that has to be consumed, all of that expense is gonna get absorbed by the margins of the pharmaceutical company. If it's going into a plastic water bottle that people maybe don't even want to consume as much anymore, um, and they're very price sensitive, it's a, a you know a, a, a quite elastic demand for that product. I don't think you want to be in that space. And so these are the choices you have to make. So what are we doing in the portfolio? We're leaning into areas that have less cyclicality, higher margins, and uh, less raw material risk. So what are those? I mentioned healthcare. Well. Healthcare inflation is here. Uh, it's been around for a while. We basically, as a society, absorb it. And I think that's an area that's going to do just fine, sort of independent of what's happening uh, on the macro level. You do have to worry about regulation, but putting that aside, I think healthcare is uh, a relatively safe place to be. We do like tech. Uh, tech is a very broad uh, uh, category. There's the emerging ne you know, er negative earnings, er negative cash flow businesses that uh, uh, occupy a lot of the NASDAQ. We're not talking about those. We're talking about businesses that generate revenues, earnings, and cash flows and are growing. Uh, 
Think about some of the products that we use in our office. It's very hard to rip out a lot of the technology we use working at an investment management firm. So maybe we don't like it. Maybe we would prefer to pay less or get rid of it. We could. We can't. We're dependent on these things. And so these are uh, products that, uh, because of the uh, mission critical nature of the product, they can raise prices and absorb all the, all, all the all the margin impact. You know what what a lot of people ask about now is if rates are rising, what is that going to mean for uh, companies' ability to service debt? Particularly floating rate, right? The coupons uh, floating, uh, depending on the credit, either monthly or every three months or so on. So as short rates rise, well, how do they how do they deal with that? In in high yield and investment grade, it's fixed, but you know they have varying maturities. So as bonds roll off, they have to service this. Uh, you can. There's a lot of analysis about this, but I think you could just boil it down to growth. Uh, if you have growth, then you can cover interest expense, you can cover commodity inflation, you can co uh, cover other costs that are rising. But if you don't have growth, you have a problem. There's a lot of analysis that shows that if companies had zero growth, they can absorb probably around 200 basis points of uh, rate increases without having stress. Now that's on average, some won't make it. Um, so you can, we can sit and predict whether we think they're going to have 200 basis points of rate increases, 250 or so on. After we get over 200, it starts to put stress on companies unless they're growing, <coughs> excuse me, unless they're growing. So this whole, you know, goes back to where I started. We need growth. And if we don't have growth on a macro level, then we have to pick credits that we think are going to be growing. The credits that are stagnant, or might even be declining because of margin pressures. Um, those are the ones we need to avoid. A segment of the of the below investment grade market that tends to exist in hot markets are what some people call zombie companies, right? Credits that basically aren't growing. They're not necessarily shrinking enough to default, but they're not growing fast enough to grow into their balance sheet and get into better credit metrics where they get upgraded and sort of fall into a, a better credit profile. Uh, well, if you have a zombie company where revenues are flat, earnings are flat, and costs are rising, whether it's operational costs or costs of financing in terms of interest rates, uh, well, that's a problem. So how are you going to cover all this if your revenues and earnings are static? Well, you really can't. And so I think those are areas that you want to tease out. So I'm sort of just like thinking through the process of how we analyze individual sectors and credits and put those in the portfolio. I think if this is a, this is the sort of the moment where you have to kind of refresh your portfolio and think, why did I buy this? What was the outlook that I was I thought was good, was going to occur? Is that still realistic? And if not, we need to move things around. So there's a lot to unpackage in there, Doctor. You know, yep. as, as you went through a lot of uh, you went through you know perhaps different scenarios for for the economy moving forward. You moved through some various scenarios in terms of rates, but Let's take a step back and if you can just paint a picture for our listeners, kind of where we are in the fundamental backdrop, um, how that plays into your outlook. And when we talk about fundamentals, you know, maybe you can address some of the, the issuance that's gone, that's been taking place since the, uh, since the pandemic, what that means for leverage ratios, what that means for interest coverage ratios, where we're at today, and just overall credit quality. What, what does default and distress rates look like for um, you know, this is called IG and, and below investment grade. We can package the loans and, and high yield together as the below investment grade uh, to help facilitate the answer there. But how, how do things look today and what is your expectations for how they may look given where we see rates moving and where you may see the economy going? If you look backwards, they look quite, they look really quite good, right? So the fourth quarter earnings for most of uh, below investment grade mark, uh, below investment grade and investment grade, earnings have been up nearly 20%. So we've seen growth, um, sort of a re reflationary rebound. So growth generates an upgrade cycle. We've seen more upgrades than downgrades last year through really up until now. Uh, there is still about 200 billion of so-called rising stars high yield bonds, high yield double Bs that are likely to get upgraded to investment grade. Uh, we see interest coverage ratios, which is a hot topic now, being near all time high. Leverage is elevated, but coming down because leverage was sort of 
uh, pandemic, you know, at a pandemic sort of nonsensical level because earnings collapsed and then now they have recovered. And so the leverage ratios are sort of average, I would say. And so looking backward, things look pretty good. You have growth, uh, you have good credit metrics, uh, you have an upgrade cycle, you have low defaults, you have uh, a lot of, well, you had the uh, maturity wall pushed out because you had record new issuance in investment grade and high yield last year. So the setup is pretty accommodative, right? Um, hey, Rob, what, what, where does that maturity wall stand now? Because we know that a lot of times in like the below investor grade market, it's not it's not the ongoing servicing that really takes out a company. It's that, you know, debt payment due, rolling the debt, refinancing it, and potentially a higher level. So where does that, where do those maturity walls sit today within those, uh, both the IG and the below investment grade markets? Yeah, I mean, we're really, I feel like every company that could refinance has. So we're probably looking at around five years or so to generalize across the markets. Yeah. Or you get to a real big step up in maturities. Yeah, so that's a that's a positive for credit though, right? That's, Historically, at least it has been, right? That's a very big positive for credit. And for fixed rate credit, investment grade and high yield, that means the day of reckoning from, high, from higher rates is someday down the road. And so they have, uh, of course, you know, uh, incentives matter and you have very low rates, borrowers borrow as much as they can. And now that's uh, fixed for quite a while. So uh, different issue in loans where rates are rising and they're feeling that pinch from the rising rates, but the maturity wall has been pushed out for quite a long time. And that's an element of what causes defaults, as you, as you mentioned. It's uh, liquidity from just operations, but it could be a liquidity crunch because you have maturity. That, that's not the problem right now. Um, so back to like the high level, uh, you know, the credit markets look pretty good. Uh, spreads are tight. Uh, credit metrics look good. Uh, revenue and EBITDA growth has been very strong above trend. So if you just look backward, you'd say, Things are great. Uh, I think looking forward, you have to think about, are they gonna remain great? Um, I have trouble believing that 2022 is gonna look like 2021. And so when you have a spread location and an equity market with a equity market multiple that's trading similar to where it did in 2021, I have to ask myself, do I think the conditions of 2022 are gonna be the same as 2021? And I, I, just, I just can't get there. I feel like, you know, the upside case is that we have the so-called soft landing. The growth slows, inflation calms down and, and tempers it's in, to something more manageable. And uh, we, we live at a lower growth rate, which is actually great for credit. If we're going to have a 3 4% growth rate and inflation calming down, then that's great. Then, you know, kind of all, all you know, full steam ahead. Uh, it, if to me, it seems a little bit more difficult that maybe the Fed has to slam on the brakes and have more of a hard landing. Well, then we're gonna have disruptions. And that's how I'm thinking about the world is that looking backward, everything looks great, but these disruptions, either the Fed's going to move too slowly and the macro conditions are gonna cause their own slowing or the Fed's gonna slam on the brakes and cause slowing. And that, that, that's, that's kind of how I'm thinking about looking forward. Yeah, so let's put that together then. So you have the ability to buy higher quality debt within the corporate credit market. That higher quality debt uh, inherently has more interest rate sensitivity. So has a problem potentially with what's going on with the Fed and, and the rising rate environment. Um, you have the blow investment grade market, which you know you talked about some of the fundamentals that, that look okay there. Um, but also, you know, again, if you have a slowing economy, that's not good for growth necessarily in those areas. And then you have loans, which although investors clamor for loans in a rising rate environment, and, you know, we know the, but based on the forward curve that those are set to reprice higher, um, you have the challenge that those companies have to pay the higher coupon. So how are you thinking about kind of relative positioning across those three segments of the market? And what are you doing for our investors here at DoubleLine? I think, of course, it's very portfolio specific because it depends on time horizon, which is kind of like a, you know, maybe it sounds like a way out of out of the answer. But if you are looking to generate higher returns and you're willing to be locked up for a longer period of time, you can buy credits that are going to have volatility. And if you do your credit work right and there really is that coverage, you can find a way to clip that coupon through the volatility and get to the other end. 
in some cases, you even might even have a default and you can, you know, it's not the case that a default equals automatic loss. There are scenarios where there is enough value in a business where even if they have to default, you can find a way through. So, uh, you know, you have to keep that in mind. It depends on the outlook. Uh, if I think about where we are now though, uh, with tight spreads, with rising rates on the horizon, with credit quality, let's just say growth is slowing. I think it's a matter of a migration. I think you have to migrate from the, you know, the greatest sort of risk on reflationary trade to something more moderate. So that means buying some more investment grade. So I've been more supportive of investment grade because, partly because of where we are in the growth cycle uh, because these are much stronger companies. Um, I think we're getting closer to the end of the rate rise. I'm not gonna you know, be bold enough to say it's done because that will come back to haunt me, but you know, we're probably in the second half rather than the, than the first half. So the risk of um, suffering losses due to duration is less now than it was at the beginning of the year. So you migrate in that direction. And uh, I think you cycle portfolios to be more, you know, not all at once, but you migrate uh, to more, more uh, defensive as opposed to some more pro-cyclical sectors. So whether it's investment grade or high yield, I think you want to start maybe fading your exposure to uh, anything that's tied to consumer discretionary, uh, retailers, um, deep cyclicals, um, re reposition the portfolio in credit in, in credit to companies that are stable through uh, economic volatility. So uh, when, so you, when you say deep cyclicals, uh, explain that to the layman here. What, yeah. what are deep cyclicals? A deep cyclical would be uh, companies who a company that is, uh, uh, experiences pretty uh, significant revenue and earnings volatility. So I don't know there's like a classic definition, but let's say 20% uh, earnings volatility through an economic cycle. Like a hospital, it's probably not going to have 20% earnings volatility. It's kind of steady, Eddie. Um, a chemical factory or a refiner could have, uh, you know, 100% or more. It's almost, in, you know, you can't even calculate because sometimes they go negative. Um, so those would be a deep cyclical. A refiner whose earnings could be a billion dollars one year and then zero the next year, that's, that's a deep cyclical. So what, what's the line of demarcation? I don't know, 20, 30%. Rev, uh, earnings volatility is probably about a ballpark of where um, where I would draw the line. And so a, a company that might experience that kind of volatility, um, I think that's something you want to fade out of the portfolio and get closer to the credits that might have less than 20% earnings volatility when the economy gets weak. That's how I'm thinking about it. So it's really a tilt. You know, I think we're in an environment where there, there's a lot of scenarios that could play out. I mean, a soft landing could happen. I can't rule that out. Um, there could be a kind of a, a, a somewhat jarring hard landing, which could tip us into a recession. You know, maybe the more likely, the highest probability is somewhere in between where there's some bumps. Uh, the Fed pushes hard, growth starts to slow, but we don't dip into inflation. So or into recession, not inflation. We dip into, you know, we just stay above zero growth. I think that's fine for credit, but there's going to be winners and losers. So if I were to draw a distribution, the most likely scenario, somewhere in the middle where we have above, we, we don't have recessionary growth, but we have anemic growth, there's going to definitely be winners and losers. And I think that's where credit picking becomes very important. I expect us to have dispersion, meaning that the, um, that the yields that uh, you know the best companies have are much tighter than the yields on um, you know the most cyclical and the lowest quality. So uh, that's how I think about it. Um, yeah. Well, I was going to say on, on that note too. When you're we're thinking about that, I think there's a lot of people that say, well, the the yield curve's inverted. Um, it's although it is not inverted today, uh, it's now steepened. Yeah. Uh, we have five basis points on two's 10. So goodbye inversion for, for today. Uh, we'll see what tomorrow brings. But, um, you know, I, there's this phrase called stagflation that keeps throwing around. Uh, people are talking about how uh, just, just the inflationary environment, the Fed's not going to be able to control it. 
How do you think about this translation to earnings? I know you're talking about pricing power and the likes, but what do you see about earnings and how you, you know you're, they're set to grow in 2022 and potentially in 23? Um, are are they really kind of this Fed interest rate related, or is it really just still all about the consumer and the resilience we've seen to date? So, how are you thinking about earnings and how that relates to credit markets? Well, stagflation is problematic for equity markets and for credit markets because if you have stagnant growth in the stag part of inflation, you know, that's the stagnant part. If you have what I was going back before, you have flat growth. So revenue earnings are all basically kind of flatline or growing slowly, an environment where you have inflation that's rising and I guess potentially rising rates to try to kill inflation. Well, that's the worst case scenario, right? Because you don't have the capacity, some companies, you know, on average companies don't have the ability to absorb these increasing uh, uh, costs in their capital, in their, in their income, uh, you know, in their income statement. So like I said, raw material prices are going up, uh, labor's going up, cost of financing's going up. Well, for some companies, it doesn't matter. Like, is that going to slow down Microsoft? I, I don't know, Pro probably not. You know, the, the darlings of the S&P that are, are growing and generating cash flow, they're probably fine. You know, people talk about the fangs. Uh, not all the fangs are created equal, but some of them continue to grow. They should be fine. But you think about like an auto, uh, uh, you know, the automotive industry, like Ford or GM, <clears throat> if uh, the consumer's pinched, raw, uh, inflation is rising, they have supply shortages, so they can't make enough cars. Their cost of financing is going up. Ford, by the way, is below investment grade, so you know their their financing costs are real. Uh, that's going to pinch growth. That's going to pinch their ability to generate earnings. Um, so I, I I think that's a that's a big problem, particularly for companies that don't have a lot of room to to maneuver around. They don't have a lot of cushion to absorb this. So I think Ford that's that's a challenge. Now the estimates for Ford all look rosy. It's kind of funny because you, you know, I looked at it uh, before we jumped on this call and the, you know, the consensus estimates for growth and EBITDA and everything's great. So it really depends on, on, on the sector and the companies in particular, but from a macro perspective, if I see <clears throat> flat earnings and growing costs, well, it, it has to come out of somewhere. And uh, uh, if, there's not, if, you know, if there's no earnings to absorb, then, then that's a problem. So, so you've been doing this for over two decades, right? I mean, you, you've learned a lot of tricks to the trade. You've seen different parts of the, of the cyclicality of the economy. Uh, what are some of the signs you look for that signal weakness within credit markets? We talked about maturity walls. That's the layman like me. That's what I think about from a macro standpoint. But what are some of the metrics you look at, like I'll call them the internals of the credit market that give you signals and that, that tell you when things are going bad or when, when you should be taking more risk? And, and what do those signals look like today? Yeah, uh, well, I mean, spreads are one, right? So tight spreads usually mean there's not a lot of opportunity. Spreads are tight right now. I like to look at the difference in performance by rating category, uh, you know, triple A, triple B, double B, triple C. Triple C is usually a pretty good benchmark if, uh, the market is feeling exuberant and everything and and, and uh, macro conditions are strong and earnings are growing triple c's perform well so uh, and triple c's up until recently have been outperforming uh, and there's starting to be a mixed signal so i don't know right now if i could say that there's a trend yet if i look up until the last few weeks triple c's have been outperforming so that looks good uh, issuance. But maybe one way to do that on a forward-looking basis, is that like a spread differential or a yield differential? Is that one way of like thinking? Because performance is always backward-looking. Is that one indicator you look at? Yeah. If you start to see widening of triple Cs relative to, let's say, double Bs, that would be indi indication that there's concern in the market. Okay. Um, you know, investment grade's a different market. So uh, I like to look at triple A versus triple B. Some people look at triple B versus double B, which I think tells you something, but it's also important to think about the fact that two separate markets. So the high yield market might be excited and the investment grade market might be nervous. Yeah. You have spread compression then between triple B and double B. So it's the same market, but two different buyers. So it behaves differently. But uh, yeah, the lower credit quality of, of each asset class. So investment grade, high yield, how bank loans, how other asset classes, like how does CLOs 
you know, where are double D spreads on CLOs? Maybe the CLO market's sniffing out something that the uh, corporate market isn't or, or CMBS or ABS and so on. I think looking at all these spreads sort of our information, but back to corporates, certainly I look at the uh, spread differentials between uh, higher quality and lower quality. Issuance is important. Um, what happens in a hot market is, a, is you have record issuance, which we did last year, um, which is in itself not anything really indicating uh, a concern. It pushes out maturities, which is a good thing. But what also happens in a hot market with lots of new issuance is you get is complacency sets in, and that sets the table for weakness and defaults down the road. So complacency can be in terms of structure. So we've heard about you know covenant light. Uh, weak structures where companies are able to borrow amounts of money without really any controls on additional debt um, or, or requirements to repay debt, sort of traditional things, right? If you're, as a lender, you want to get paid back. You don't want the borrower to be sending the money somewhere else, buying assets, doing things. So structure, structure weakens. Uh, money flows to companies that shouldn't get money. So there were a couple different crypto uh, financings in the high yield market last year. Now, you know, we get into crypto, that's a whole different subject, but needless to say, cryptocurrencies are highly volatile. They don't generate stable earnings. They're not the kind of thing you put leverage on in the corporate credit market. So when those things seep in, they suggest that the market's getting complacent. And so those are the signs that you have, maybe not end of cycle. I think I like the term end of cycle behavior because you don't know when the end of cycle is happening, but you can observe the end of cycle behavior. We definitely saw that in, um, in 2021, but then the market has you know, maybe gotten a little bit of religion with uh, uh, you know, basically post uh, the Russia invasion of Ukraine. So middle of March, spreads widened out. They've now tightened, but there's still a level of, uh, you know, uh, I guess, uh, lender, uh, lender tightness. There's a little bit of uh, uh, maybe discerning of, of, of credit quality. So you're not seeing you know, the worst offenders of uh, business plans and credit quality, you're seeing a little bit more focus on structure. So I think the market has tightened a little bit relative to where it was on structure and credit, even though spreads are tighter. So you mentioned Covenant Light. This, this was all the rage you know, in the, uh, well, I wouldn't say you know, but all the rage that say in like 2011, 12, 13, the degradation of the covenants, um, and I know that in our conversations, you and I've discussed this where, you know, some of these covenants, you're like, well, some of them don't matter, right? But now here we come into this part of the, of the cycle and should, be, should investors be concerned or have an elevated risk, level, uh, uh, risk alert on the loan market because of the lack of covenants and this cov light structure, as we call it, um, that it dominates the market? I think, you know, Back in like 07, it was something like, you know, 15, 20 percent of the market. We were like, that was insane. We'll never do that again. It got down to like five. And what are we at, like 75, 80 percent today? So right. what does that portend for, for credit and the loan market? And how do you think about that as someone who lends money in the loan market? Yeah, well, it's not that they don't matter. I think there was overemphasis on it. So two examples would be if you had a very strong company, maybe it was a healthcare company that's very strong, it's high double B, it's gonna get upgraded to investment grade, it has no covenants. Then you have a coal company that, uh, uh, and, you know, coal's back, but back then coal was uh, suffering from pricing declines. It's got a lot, you know, it's cyclical, um, but it has a covenant. So what would you feel better about? Investing in the coal company with the covenant or the best in class healthcare company without a covenant? Well, it's, you know, it's obviously, not, the point is it's not that simple. A very strong company that's growing, that has a bright outlook. I think you can uh, incorporate a, a, a more relaxed covenant package in your analysis, but you can't ignore it. Just like a very weak company, you can't just slap a covenant on it and be fine. Uh, for better or worse, covenants in the loan market and then sort of what people call incurrence covenants in the, in the high yield market, you know, ability to add more debt, dividend cash out, those have all weakened. And you know, whether you like it or not, that's just the market we're in. And so you can't rely on that structure for protection. You have to look to other things. And those other things are the credit quality of the business. Is it growing? You know, all the things I've been talking about. Is it owned by 
uh, either uh, you know a public company? Is it is it a sponsor owned? Who who owns the business? And what are what are their intentions? Some sponsors are very aggressive and do move assets around in a way that's not good for lenders. Other companies might be public or they're uh, owned by a very friendly sponsor. You really have to look at the overall credit story. And so uh, my problem with covenants back when that was a, like all the rage, as you say, is that there was over-reliance on them. And the idea was if I had a covenant, I had a safe loan. Well, that's not true. Like, you know, there's a difference between safe and secure. Secure means you have security and you have a lot of documentation. That doesn't mean you have a safe loan or bond. Safe to me means you have a company that has, that's growing, generates lots of cash flow and intends to pay you back. That's a safe loan. A well-structured loan or bond that might save you, but if it's not safe, meaning they either don't have the ability or they are not willing to pay you back, I think relying on the structure uh, may make you fall short. Yeah. So what is your advice before we let you go? What's your advice to investors who are, are investing in the corporate markets, whether that's investment grade, below investment grade or loans, you know, what is your biggest advice to, to folks today when thinking about how they structure their portfolios? Yeah, I, I think it's about patience and not swinging every pitch. Um, I think that with uh, 2022 and beyond, where we're talking about volatility. That means the opportunities will come, but don't rush. So I think if I had one word, I'd say patience. Wait for the right opportunity and, uh, uh, and don't be in a hurry. Well, if you're summarizing things with one word, I'll that means eight. we have to we have to bring you to Sam's favorite part ah, of the show. Then perfect. you're just already front running it. So, yeah. uh, right. so Mr. Cohen, let me turn it over to Sam Loud to introduce you to his favorite part of the show. Okay. All right, Doctor. So, my favorite part of the show is called Sherman Says. It's where I will offer a series of alternating prompts between Jeff Sherman and yourself, to which I hope to elicit a top of mind response. Uh, and uh, I'm just gonna call it concise, concise response. So you're an old pro at this one, so I'm just gonna jump right into it with uh, the prompt for Sherman, yield curve inversion. Don't ignore it. Doctor, you've got real wage growth. Uh, declining. Labor demand supply gap. Widening. It really oh, is. I mean, look at Joel's, look at this. I mean, it's really widened. And I think that's what's really perplexing to the Fed right now, too, is that, you know, you just don't have enough people with the qualifications and, and the ability to do those jobs or the desire. No one's stepping in. Uh, profit margins. Pressure, going to be pressured. <laughs> Sanction escalation. Seems like every day, right? Mm -hmm. uh, that they continue to do so. So um, the problem with the sanctions, it takes a long time to choke off uh, something like, uh, you know, Russia. So I, I don't know how to feel about it. So, um, but I, I think it's going to continue. CapEx spending. Mm -hmm. Declining. The path of fiscal policy. Declining. I think it's becomes more challenging, you know, with, uh, you know, the, the more contentious that Congress becomes and with the midterms and, you know, the, the forecast with uh, the Republicans that take over, you know, both chambers of the House or both the House and the Senate, both chambers of Congress. Uh, I mean, I can't see it getting any more accommodative. So you got to you got to unaccommodate a Fed like like Cohen's telling us. You know, you got fiscal policies that they can't figure anything out. And then there's only going to be more contention. Sure doesn't seem like there's a lot of reliance on uh, someone to bail us out of this in the near term. All right. Globalization. So on the way out, we're making, Amer we're making things in America again. You know, it's funny you say that. I'm, I'm going to derail this conversation real quick. Because you say that, that we're making things there. I get this, you know, this response that we don't make anything in this country. It's a very flippant comment that a lot of people make and say we don't make anything. Tell, tell me what we make in this country, Cohen, to set the record straight on we, things that we actually produce here. I mean, we have one of the fastest growing car companies right here in the U.S., right? So that's the 
and we're going to have more. So uh, uh, we have, so we have an auto industry. We have, uh, I think, high tech semiconductors are going to come back to the U.S. I always found it like rather kind of unbelievable that uh, Silicon Valley actually designed silicon, but the actual silicon's made somewhere else. Um, I do remember, I you know, showing my age, I actually went to a, a, a silicon. Uh, a wafer manufacturer in Phoenix. So they do exist. So I've physically seen one and those are <laughs> gonna come back. Uh, uh, you know, there's a soft cost to manufacturing overseas and for high tech items, that soft cost, we're, we're now seeing what that soft cost is in real time with supply disruptions, inability to modify, um, you know, products. During the pandemic, we, we've learned that a lot of pharmaceuticals were made in China and now China is a geopolitical, uh, you know, uh, a geopolitical threat to us, uh, uh, you know, a competitor. So for essential items, pharmaceuticals, semiconductors, whatever, telecom equipment, uh, I, I think it's time to start making that in the U.S. And I think that's already happening. So now we, it's not true that nothing that that we're all just uh, showrooms and restaurants. Uh, we do make hard goods here in the U.S. <laughs> and I, I I expect that to continue. So like once we get through all this you know, kind of macro noise and so on. I think maybe it'll be a renaissance for the U.S. where we actually have normalized rates uh, uh, and we're not shipping our factories overseas. We're bringing them back here. And maybe we actually have more durable growth at that point. So yeah, the giant stucking noise back into the U.S. then. Yeah, exactly. Is that is that a Ross Pro reference? It yes. is. Okay. So we all show in our ages. <laughs> 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 All right, the last one uh, I'm going to for each of you was Sherman first, Dr. Copper. Healthy. <clears throat> you know, it's not it's not good for uh, you know, it, he's healthy still. There's such demand there. There's a structural imbalance there. So, you know, he, probably I, I'm saying the price is healthy. Uh, unfortunately, that means it's uh, inherently disinflationary to people because uh, it's likely to continue to ratchet higher as, as this thing gets drug on. And just look at what's going on in China right now with their zero COVID policy, um, the shutdowns. Uh, I just think that this, this input cost game just is far from over at this point. Dr. Cohen, nickname Genesis. Nickname Genesis. Oh, am I going to put that on video? Uh, <laughs> I'm going to obscure it and say uh, work trip. <laughs> All right. Very good. Very well to keep it very, uh, very compliance friendly. So yeah. we appreciate that. So uh, around here, we call him the doc uh, because he, when we need something, he's the guy you go to. So doc, uh, we really enjoyed the conversation today. Thanks for elucidating our listeners with uh, the inner workings of the credit market. So um, we'll have you back soon. Um, to get an update, we'll uh, we'll pull these forecasts out and uh, we'll make an honest man of you, okay? Okay, sounds good. I'm up to the challenge. Thank, All right. Thanks for having me. Okay, thanks for joining everybody. Uh, again, this was uh, the Sherman Show on April 5th, 2022. Um, you can catch these videos on our YouTube channel, youtube.com backslash double line capital. Uh, you can also catch us on all of your podcast servers out there, SoundCloud, YouTube, or sorry, SoundCloud, Google Play, iTunes. I, I get those confused all the time. iTunes, YouTube, one of those things out there. One of the things, right, Doc? Um, okay. And so, yeah. And so we'll be back. Uh, we'll be back in two weeks with a very, very special guest as well. And uh, we thank you guys for listening in and tuning in to the Sherman Show. Take care. Mm -hmm.